My mom is a nurse and works night shifts. My older brother and I are used to being home alone at night. My best friend came over for a sleepover night, so heck yeah, girls night. We banished my brother to his basement bedroom, but I check up on him at around midnight. He was out like a light. I lock up, shut the house down, and text my mom that the house is all done and that we'll see her in the morning. My friend and I hang out in my upstairs bedroom and decide to turn on my computer and watch the popular web series, The Most Popular Girls. For those of you who don't know it, check it out, it's pretty hilarious. Anyway, we hear someone trying to stifle laughter outside the door as we were watching this. My friend Beth pauses the video and we hear someone trying not to laugh. I threw a stuffed animal at the door and yell, Fuck off Dawson, go back to bed. And then footsteps go down the stairs to the ground floor. Not the basement, the ground floor. I grab my phone and text him to stop lurking in the hallway, but see a few missed texts from him. They are as following. 1220. Hey, mom said to stay in the house at night, dumbass. 1223. Can you stop banging around upstairs? Some of us actually have to sleep. 1225. Thanks, uh, there's a sprite in the mini fridge by the way. I immediately get kind of spooked because we never left the house and we were upstairs in my room by 1215. I called my brother's cell phone and waited for him to pick up. He did, sounding groggy. This better be important, he said. I frantically explained what had happened, still wanting this to be an elaborate joke he was trying to pull. He was quiet for a moment, and then finally spoke, and I will never forget what he said. Open your window, get onto the roof, take your phones, and go across to Dr. Tom's house. Call the police on your way, and after that, call mom. And remember, I love you. And I love mom and dad a lot, okay? Go now! He hung up, and I'm crying as I push Beth out onto the roof. She, having heard the conversation, is already dialing 911 as she climbs down. I linger inside for a minute and start hearing crashes like breaking glass and furniture. She yells for me to come on, so I escape out the window and we bash on Dr. Tom who is my mom's co-worker's door. He's awake, being a night shifter on his day off, and lets us in. He knows my brother is in serious trouble, so he wakes up his wife and tells us to stay with her, grabs the gun from his bedside table, and heroically runs out wearing pajama bottoms and no shirt. After what feels like forever, there are sirens and yelling. Tom's seven-year-old daughter peeks out the window and tells me that there are cops taking a man from our house, and there's also an ambulance outside, on the street. I start bawling again, thinking for sure that my brother was killed. Later, my brother and Tom filled in the gaps for me. Dawson knew, since he was in the basement and underground, that if he tried to escape the house, he'd run into the intruder on the ground floor being very concept, with not many walls to hide behind. He, being my brave big brother, grabs the aluminum baseball bat from under his bed and makes sure that Beth and I can escape before going to face whoever's in our house. Turns out that this dude was armed with a knife, but my brother managed to bat it out of his hands. This intruder was crazy though and tried to attack Dawson instead of trying to escape. There was a struggle and they ended up knocking a lot of things over before Tom ran in and grabbed this dude from behind holding a gun to his head. They restrained him until the cops showed up. They brought an ambulance with them because Beth had told them that my brother was in there and could have gotten hurt. Turns out that they did need the ambulance though. Dawson had broke the intruder's hand, two ribs, and he suffered a severe gash on his leg landing on a chunk of pottery that my mom insisted on keeping, and 
possibly had head trauma. The man's in jail now for breaking and entering, and a few other unrelated charges that we weren't told about. We're gonna be notified when he's released. I'm so, so proud of my big brother for being so brave. He wasn't injured, just a few bruises and scrapes, and was treated at the scene. He looked for how the guy got in, and apparently one of the windows in the laundry room attached to the ground floor could be opened, which we were not aware of. It takes a lot of propping to slide it in to the side and fit through, and that's how he got into our house. He didn't have any of our valuables with him, even though we did have a lot of nice things that he would have for sure seen. He didn't even have a bag, and nothing was out of place besides a few of my mom's things, which really creeps me out. I'm not suffering any nightmares or PTSD over it, and neither is my brother, but Beth, sadly, is having a few issues with it. She's in counseling though, and she'll be okay. I've been debating with myself about sharing this one, mostly because I want to protect my then best friend's anonymity. I decided to carefully avoid identifying her and go for it. This took place in the summer of 2007. I was 16 at the time, and I had a pretty bad habit of crawling out of my bedroom window and going for long walks in the middle of the night. I was pretty fearless by nature, but that summer, even I was getting nervous. There was a story going around of a guy in my neighborhood, which was not in the best part of town, attacking young women. The tale went that he would find them on a bus or at a bus stop, follow them until they were alone, and then sexually assault them. I thought it was just a rumor, a rumor that persisted all summer and seemed to grow more elaborate and wild rather than fading away with time. On the second day of school, the rumor became fact. The police liaison for our high school held an assembly for all of the female students. She told us that there was a man who was targeting young women, particularly petite women, and that while no one has been raped yet, a few have been assaulted but managed to get away. She told us to be safe and to never walk alone, especially at night. I didn't listen. Like an irresponsible teenager, I continued with my late night adventures like I was invincible. At the time, my then best friend was dating a guy who really creeped me out. At the time, I was casually dating a less than stellar guy myself, so I really felt like I couldn't judge. But this guy, this guy was something else. Every time I had ever encountered or spoken with him, my internal radar went off. He seemed like an average laid back kind of guy, maybe a little unmotivated, but an okay person. At the time, I couldn't figure out what it was that raised red flags for me, but I suspected it was his body language, that subtle communication that can give away so much. My friend and I had been slowly growing apart through high school when she invited me for a sleepover just after Halloween. I thought it would be fun. We could watch a Disney movie and eat Timbits. It'd be great. When I arrived, I was suddenly doubtful. When I accepted the invitation, I didn't know that her boyfriend had moved temporarily into her house. There were two bedrooms upstairs. Her boyfriend was staying in the room beside my best friends. I thought it was a weird situation and I really didn't want to hang around with him. But I loved my friends so I stayed. Throughout the evening, the boyfriend would make little comments here and there. Just inappropriate enough for me to shoot him a dirty look but not bad enough for me to risk rocking the boat by calling him on it. Finally, my friend put her foot down. 
as her boyfriend was carrying the TV into our room so that we could watch a VHS, he suggested, jokingly, that we could have a threesome. My friend kicked him out of her room and told him to stop being gross. I was suddenly on edge. I didn't like the way he was looking at me as he left. I was so lost in my own thoughts that I hardly remember the movie. The movie ended around midnight and my friend fell asleep before it was over. I turned off the TV and flopped onto the mattress, but I couldn't sleep. A very strange thought was forming in my head. The guy stalking and assaulting women. His physical description matched her boyfriend's. The stalker's MO was to go after small young women. Both my friend and I were short and slim. I knew that the boyfriend had been in my neighborhood around the time of the attacks. I had even seen him at a bus stop once on one of my midnight walks. I told myself that I was just being paranoid and yet I couldn't drop the idea. After about an hour of lying in the dark, I was drifting off to sleep when I heard the door slowly begin to open. The room was set up with two mattresses on the floor. My friend was on the one closest to the window. Mine was so near to the door that if I reached out my leg, I could close it. The door only opened a crack before I reacted on instinct. I stretched out my leg and pushed against the door, quickly shutting it. My heart was beating so fast as my brain whirred through the scenario. Was it a burglar? No, I hadn't heard anyone coming up the stairs. It had to be the boyfriend. I waited quietly for a moment to see if her boyfriend would do anything or knock. Maybe he just wanted the TV back. He didn't say anything though. Just tried the door again and again. I scooched further down the mattress to put both my feet against the door. It was as if he couldn't decide what he wanted to do. He would try the door once or twice, walk quietly back to his room, wait a minute, then come back to try the door again. Now keep in mind, this door had no locks, so if I didn't keep my legs against the door, he could easily open it. I wasn't sure what to do. Finally, after about 30 minutes of silently trying the door, he went back to his room and I didn't hear anything else after. So I just think he fell asleep. For obvious reasons, I didn't sleep that night. I just kept my feet against the door and tried to figure out what it was that I would say to my friend. I had somewhere to be early the next morning, and my ride came at 6, so when I snuck out of my friend's house, she was still fast asleep. I left a note for her to call me ASAP. Later in the day, I called the police non-emergency line and spoke to an officer. I told her that I didn't have a lot to go on, mostly just intuition but that I did have a tip about the guy assaulting women in the neighborhood. The officer thanked me for the tip and reminded me to stay safe. For once, I listened. I didn't go on any nighttime walks for the next little while. Soon after, and before I even got a chance to talk to my friend again, her boyfriend was arrested. He had been the one after all, the guy sexually assaulting women. I guess the police were already suspicious of him, so when his DNA was matched to the last assault scene, he was caught. It was a terrible thing to go through, but my friend was really brave and she even worked with the police to get justice for the victims. The boyfriend pleaded guilty to six counts of sexual assault and three counts of sexual assault causing bodily harm in May of 2009. He was sentenced to five years in prison and to be listed on the sex offender registry for 20 years. Moral of the story is listen to your intuition. Growing up, 
I lived in a small town in a heavily forested area. In around second grade, my best friend, who shall be known as Celia, began complaining to me about very strange things happening in her household. The first thing that she pointed out to me was a smallish hole that was forming in the walls of her unfinished basement. The walls were made out of a sort of brick, cinder block material, and the hole was forming the mortar, but expanding as if the bricks were crumbling. I remember asking Celia if her parents knew about this, and she said they did, but weren't worried. Fast forward some odd years, and around 4th or 5th grade, the hole had only become larger over the years, and we could now fit a great deal of our arms into the hole. As far as my arm could go, we couldn't fill the end of the hole and couldn't explain why it would corrode deeper, but not get much bigger in girth. At this point, Celia also told me that she began hearing voices in her basement, and that she believed most of it was coming from the hole. I never heard any of these sounds when I would visit her house, but considering we were only 10 years old when this happened, I totally believed her. We frequently had sleepovers on the weekends, which is when I was usually exposed to all the creepy things wrong at her house. Her family was kind of strange in the fact that they had an abnormal amount of animals. They had at least six cats and dogs, a few rabbits, birds, lizards, snails, frogs, fish, etc. Around the time when she was hearing the voices, we began noticing that her cats and dogs would randomly disappear and only be found later in the basement standing right in front of the hole. In all the years that I knew her and her animals, I knew that they didn't like to be in the basement. It started to really scare us when she started telling me that she believed that something was living in the walls and was moving around her house, but the hole was one of their ways out. At this point in time, I believed her, but had never really seen enough proof to be scared as she was. In school, she spent most of her time in anxious wreck, and the teachers and other classmates were really worried for her. It really seemed to me like her parents just didn't care or believe her. A lot of adults believe that she was only being anxious because her much older sister was leaving for college. Now here's where we get to the most terrifying part. I was sleeping over at her house during the weekend of Christmas holiday. A slight note about Celia's room is that she has a huge collection of stuffed animals of all sizes. Clearly because of her family's love of animals. Anyways, the first night we were sleeping in her bedroom that night, and when we woke up in the next morning, we immediately saw that every stuffed animal, normally strewn about everywhere, was neatly arranged in a pile about four feet high. Every single one of them were facing us and staring right at us. I still don't believe now and didn't at the time either that someone or Celia could have moved all those toys. I have always been an extremely light sleeper and some of the animals were on top of a very large wardrobe. We both knew that whatever Celia believed to be living in the walls had to have been responsible for this. We put back all the animals very carefully and never told her parents. I sort of wished we had now. Since I was staying the entire weekend, we went again to sleep that night in her bed. We woke up around the same time when it was still dark out. We heard a very low creaking noise that was coming from underneath us. We both knew it was the wooden floors under her bed, just like in a textbook horror movie. And probably because we were only 10, we thought it was a good idea to lean over the edge of the bed and look under. Right as we looked, we saw and heard one floorboard slam back onto the ground. We shot our heads back up and held each other and cried. 
I had never been so scared in my entire life and called my parents the next morning to take me home right away. I refused to ever go back to Celia's house in fear and she only got worse at school and home. I don't remember if I ever continued to ask her about the things in her house. Maybe I didn't because I was too scared and we were just so young. For unrelated circumstances, my family moved far away from that town that summer. I have only seen her twice after that, and that was a decade ago. I have never heard from her since, but have always wondered whatever happened, as I know her family still lives in that house today. Many have suggested that this may be paranormal. I tried to be very detailed, but left out most of my personal thoughts on the matter, because the scariest part is not knowing. I want the listeners to create their scariest solution. My theory is that there was a man or group of humans living in the walls of her house. The hole was their way of seeing and hearing what was going on in the basement. As in, if no one was in the basement, they could come out. The stuffed animal thing must have been someone who was disturbed and wanted to mess with her and me. The next night, I think the floorboard trick may have been their way of listening to us if we were sleeping. Since I only saw one board move, there is no way that was how they got into the room. They probably had several surveillance points so they knew when to move around the house so I don't think that this was paranormal. I think it was a real encounter with humans. This happened around July of 2014. Some background. I'm a 19 year old female, and at the time of this event, I was 18. Me and my friends live in a small town of Stony Creek in Ontario, living in Canada. We generally are not very concerned about rapists, pedophiles, or murderers. It was a summer before we all headed off to university, and we all just generally wanted to have a good time. So the five of us decided that we would have a sleepover at my friend's house, who lived around a somewhat suburban neighborhood. So 9.30 rolls around, and here we are, blasting music, drinking, and just generally having a good time. At this point of the night, me and my friends decide that we should totally go get a late night snack. Since I had drank two coolers, I couldn't drive, because the G2 regulations of driving demanded that we have a zero alcohol blood level. No worries, we thought. A local subway restaurant was just about 15 minutes away from where my friend lived. So me and my friend were just walking on the sidewalk. My friend being a little drunk, decided to talk in a really loud and obnoxious voice about how hungry she was. Sadly, the alcohol high I was feeling faded away quickly, leaving me to contend with a drunken overactive teenager. As we were walking, we heard rustling. We looked up to see a man sitting on his porch just staring at us. This guy looked vaguely familiar to me, but I just couldn't pinpoint where I'd seen him before. He looked relatively tall, had black hair, and was a tad bit overweight. As we were passing him, I noticed that he kept on looking at my friend. I kind of shrugged it off and thought he found her attractive since she was short and looked way young to be 18. Older men were just typically drawn to her. As we were walking just past his small white house, I hear him call after us. I turn around and there he is in a grey shirt and black sweatpants, just staring really creepily at her. As we came to stop, he proceeded to ask us where we were going. Before I could muster a benign response, 
My friend happily tells them that we were going to Subway for a little snack. She doesn't usually act this sociable and is totally oblivious to the weird vibes that this creep was giving off to me. As his piercing gaze lands back out on my friend, he then goes on to ask how old she is. Now, I really start to feel scared. I know when an older man asks about a younger girl's age, nothing good can come from the situation. I try to signal with my eyes that nothing good can come from her answer. And that's when she stupidly blurts out that she's 18 years old. The creeper's eyes flicker for a second from her response. He tells her that she looks younger than an 18 year old, to where she giggly replies that she often hears that quite a bit. Now, I just really want to leave. This guy is approaching closer to my friend and I grab her arm, pulling her towards my side. The guy finally looks back at me and asks if we wanted to join him on his porch. I quickly muster a no as I try to push her down the sidewalk, but before I can turn around, he looks back to my friend and says in a deep, raspy voice that he will see her again before the night was over. I look down at her and the terror is quickly drawn on her face. Now, I know we need to leave. I haul her in front of me and we speed walk down the subway, which was just about six minutes away. As I'm constantly looking back and seeing the creeper staring her up and down, just before he looks to me, he opens his mouth in a shiver inducing smile which bares his teeth. He then proceeded to nod and turn back to his porch steps. I'm basically running now, carrying my pale looking best friend as we walk into Subway. Quickly, I recite the orders to the lady behind the counter, urging her with my eyes to pick up the pace because I just want to get back to my friends. As the woman goes about making our subs, I feel a shiver across my skin. I turn my head to the side as I look out the window to see that guy again. He was right outside of Subway, and he was just staring at us with his eyebrows drawn together. Now, I have no idea what to do. How can we just leave peacefully if he's waiting for us outside? What if he comes in? His eyes then gaze to my friend. His gaze then moves to my friend and his pupils seemed to dilate, and I know for a fact that he was undressing her with his eyes. I then noticed that he was lightly touching his crotch area, and he continued to stare at her. Now I know that this creep has gone too fucking far. I tell the lady behind the counter and point my finger towards the sicko. As she turns her neck to look at him, her eyes widen. She stops making our subs and just leaves abruptly to go to the back room. The creep notices that something was off and just turns and leaves, walking briskly out of the vicinity. When the lady came back, she abruptly handed me a poster. The name on the poster said that the man we had just met was named Keith and that he was a convicted rapist in Hamilton. He sexually assaulted a young boy in a park and raped a blind woman. He even raped and beat a young woman in her parents' basement. The poster listed the details of his parole. He wasn't allowed to be alone with children under the age of 16, and he could not go to any community parks or pools. His curfew was 11 p.m. When we looked at the time, it was only 10.08. This guy was listed as likely to be able to re-offend again. The thing that really creeped me out was his unnatural obsession with young boys and girls. That was why he was so fixated on my friend. We didn't know whether to notify his parole officer since he technically didn't breach any of the conditions of his parole. We also didn't want to get in trouble with our parents for underage drinking walking around at midnight. So, we decided to just keep it to ourselves. Shortly after, 
I called my friend to come pick us up because there was no way I was walking past his house again. This creep was the epitome of evil. He told a reporter that he calls his condition the devil's curse. His conditions were that he had to meet a therapist once a week to keep his sexual urges at bay. Thankfully, he was arrested a few days later for a breach in curfew. This happened a couple years back to a friend and I. We were about 14 then. I was sleeping over at my friend's house and we were watching a movie in the living room. We lived in a nice area where there was almost no crime and she lived in a small neighborhood almost no one passed through. We always kept the door locked just in case though. About midway through the movie, we heard a car pull up near the house. We didn't think much of it because her father was at work and we just thought he was coming home. We were wrong. Someone started knocking on the door. Her father had a key, so it couldn't have been him. I told my friend Cameron that I was going to look through the peephole. I looked out and saw a man in about his mid-40s standing by the door. He looked dirty and was scratching at his head, arms, and chest. He was dirty looking and scratching his head, arms, and chest. I thought that he must have been on some type of drugs because he had wild eyes. I walked back to the couch where Cameron was and I sat with her. I thought that the guy had left because there was no sounds coming from outside. Just after I thought everything was fine, the door handle started to shake. The man was trying to get inside the house. Me and my friend's eyes widened in fear. I told her to turn off the TV and go behind the couch just in case there was anywhere he could see through. I want in was the line that got my heart racing extremely fast. At this point, he was banging on the door. I want in. Clearly, this mad would not give up on trying to get into the house. Cameron was pretty much on the verge of tears, and I couldn't breathe. Luckily, Cameron's father had come home, and the car coming in scared the guy off. We ran to her dad and told him what had happened. He called the cops even though there wasn't much they could do. I stayed the rest of the night, but in the morning, I went home. I told my mom and told her that the cops were called. My friend was horrified to be at her house alone for a while, so she slept over at my house every night. We never saw that man around anymore, which I'm very thankful for. That had to be one of the most horrifying moments I've ever experienced.